Miigwech Mishomis Gibwase Juyong Nungwa. Miigwech. Thank you, Grandfather, for shining on us today. Miigwech Nkidame Nungwa Gijigak. Wewene Jinnung Kudunwab Mong Kudwa Nuiji Bamadza Jik. Minwa Wewene Gunun Nong Gidwa. Miigwech Gaye Shkukumukwe Gimi Jan Minung Bamadza Win. Miigwech Gimi Jan Mijum. Miigwech Gimi Jan Bish. Gimi Jan Wesiog. Minwa Gimi Jan Nesewin. Sema and Bug Bugadana Wabnung Jawanung Abigishmuk Minwa Giwanung Narmoshanung Jimshko Gabriang Minwa Jazun Dea Yang Miigwech Nokmis Miigwech Mishomis Miigwech Miigwech Miigwech
Bonjour Kenawea. My name is Jacqueline French, Chief of Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. It is with the solemn heart that I welcome you here to our virtual Orange Shirt Day. Each year on this day of September 30th, we honour our residential school survivors, as well as those who never came home by holding a memorial event at our Mont Elgin Monument, which was built near the site where the residential school operated for a total of 141 years. First, as a boarding school for 95 years from 1851 to 1946, and then as a day school for 46 years from 1946 to 1992. At its peak, Mont Elgin housed 160 students at a time and was heartbreaking destination for many Indigenous children who were forced to attend from all across the nation. Thankfully, this institution, which called itself a school, is now closed. As we walk this path of truth together, we must acknowledge that genuine healing for our communities can only occur once the issue of the unmarked burial sites has been put to rest. For all of us to move forward to a brighter future for coming generations, we intend to answer this lingering question and to finally provide closure to our people. Chimi Gwech for joining us on our journey today. Ani Bojo, uh, welcome to Chippewa the Thames First Nation um, in the Anishinaabek territory. Uh, it is a great honor to sit before you and um, acknowledge as we begin that healing journey. This is our fifth annual uh, honoring of our residential school survivors, past and present. Um, today marks a day um, that we reflect in our communities on the impacts of residential schools uh, in our communities and remember those young children that never came home. It is a day to honor their spirit and honor our people as we begin to prepare and strengthen our communities for future generations. Today, we look back at where we have grown and where we want to move forward in helping our communities. Residential schools in our community was very detrimental to our family structures. We as Indigenous people are resilient and we have to give thanks to our ancestors and to our our families as we begin to strengthen our communities. We in Chippewa, the Thames First Nation, have honored our residential school survivors over the past five years. In 2017, we held a sunrise ceremony here, um, had our children uh, play a role in that day for our, our community and our survivors. Um, as well as in 2018, we reflected back and brought um, Don Burnstick to the community to uh, bring that healing and laughter to our people. In 2019, we held a uh, sunrise ceremony again in the community um, took a reflection back um, and honored our residential school survivors by giving eagle feathers. Um, last year, 2020, um, due to COVID, it was a very smaller, uh, more intimate celebration here for Chippewa, the Thames First Nation. Um, and this year, uh, we are doing this more virtually just to ensure the 
uh, protection of our community safety during these unprecedented times. Our honoring of our residential school survivors is not only for Chippewa, the Thames First Nation, but we've also always invited our neighboring communities, the Muncie, Delaware Nation and Oneida Nation of the Thames. And with that today, you know, I like to acknowledge um, each of those people that have come to make this a, a very beautiful commemoration of our our community and of our survivors. I'd like to acknowledge Chief French who did the opening remarks and welcoming you to our territory. I'd like to acknowledge Betsy Kijigo who was doing the Anishinaabe prayer. I'd also like to acknowledge the Three Fires drum and Raymond Delary who sang for us the Three Fires Confederacy song, as well as I'd like to acknowledge Kelly Riley, who did the work and it is and is doing some remarkable work on the Mount Elgin site investigation. Gina McGackie, who did an awesome presentation to you on the history of the Mount Elgin School here in our community. Nancy Delary, who was very instrumental in the work for the building of our monuments and the designing of the monument in front of our health center, as well as Sarah Delary, who is our leader uh, in our Save the Barn campaign. And as well, I cannot express how proud I am to say that um, we have our uh, young little woodpeckers hen girls drum group that is closing out today's event um, and it is extremely important to show showcase our young uh, girls and how our women are so instrumental to our community, to our culture, to our leaders. And furthermore, there are um, events happening within our community. Um, in Oneida, Oneida Nation is hosting a memorial walk in honor of their residential school survivors at the Scanadot Conservation area and as well as our community Muncie Delaware and Oneida are participating in a water carriers walk. This walk is to honor our residential school survivors and it is us women that are carriers of the water. We are the ones that carry our children and bring to life that gift. So we are today acknowledging and carrying that water for our children because our children are our future and our children and our women are our leaders as well as those men that we cannot um, we cannot do we cannot be alone without the strength of our men who are our protectors they are our protection are our hunters, they are our fishers. Um, with that, um, I'd like to say chi to you know, my communications team here today doing this um, amazing work and knowing that, you know, it's so important for um, future generations to see um, where our community is leading to it is my hope through this annual acknowledgement that our children begin to learn more about um, the impacts of how specifically how residential schools have impacted our families but we also are in need of healing and this is one part of our healing for our people and i say chi miigwech and bamapi Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Kelly Riley. 
and I want to talk a little bit about the investigation that is going on in Chippewa of the Thames. Shortly following the announcement last June of um, the discovery of a number of unmarked grave sites in Kamloops, um, it quick, very quickly um, triggered our tree land and environment team to put a small team together, primarily the research and the lands department. At first, I want to um, thank all of the different groups out there that have offered assistance in our investigation and to let everyone know, in particular the band members, that this investigation is led entirely by Chippewa the Thames. And I also should mention that um, while the Treaty Lands and Environment Department is taking a bit of a lead role at this point in time, there are other departments within Chippewa that as, as with the fullness of time, the culture and heritage, the health department and the social service department will also provide assistance and help a little further down the road. There are three stages in this investigation. The first stage is really, it's primarily research. And it has to be this way because our residential school, or the school that was at this site, really was in operation for nearly a hundred years, starting in roughly 1850, 1851, and ending in the uh, late 1940s. So it's been some 80 odd years since, since this school was in operation. Um, the First Nations out west, such as Kamloops, the residential school was still standing and pretty much everyone knew where the unmarked burial sites were. They could point them out. We have a much more difficult task in that we have very few survivors of Mount Elgin Residential School. So step one is primarily research, archival in nature, and we've made a good use of the truth and reconciliation uh, research. We've reached out uh, to a number of my former archaeology uh, comrades, and a range of professionals have been been involved to some degree. They'd be in archaeology, anthropology, and pathology. We estimate it'll be uh, between three and five years of. Um, so we could find, perhaps put closure to this issue. And I think that might be one of the end goals, you know, in, in this whole investigation is to reach a point in time using the best resources available to put to rest some of the rumors, some of the oral history that's going on within the community, and with some certainty uh, close a chapter in the book of the Mount Elgin Residential Institute. We have been looking at residential school records. These are records held by the United Church and other groups. And we've looked at probably 1,400 pieces of paper. And I really want to uh, extend my appreciation to the work that's gone on in the near past. That's with the uh, residential school survivors. They assembled a number of years ago and through their, their good work and hard work and I guess sometimes sad work. Um, I'm sitting in front of you right now in, a, in front of a beautiful memorial that you know, has the names of a lot of people that attended residential schools and not necessarily just Mount Elgin. Um, one of the things that, that's going to occur is we'll be developing a, a good understanding of our own history, and we're sometimes remiss in that. Um, we'll have a very clear story of the beginning parts of the residential school till it ended. We'll probably be developing a timeline of different activities. Um, one of the things that we're looking fairly specifically is 
to is identifying the actual students, the names of the students that attended this uh, residential school. Uh, what we're going to learn about also is, um, is actually a, the history of the, the churches and the religions in Chippewa Thames. 1850 was a long time ago. Um, and there have been many different types of uh, Christianity that has emerged and then to some degree has subsided within the community. This, as, a, as an aside or, or something that um, I've come to recognize is that, uh, and it's really important that this investigation really is looking at the students that are associated with the residential school here at Chippewa. I've uh, come to know that there are at least six different ways in which we uh, buried our ancestors. Some very, very traditional ways that perhaps for thousands of years our people have been buried. Probably in the fall time and maybe a little later on in the fall when the uh, leaves have fallen from the trees, we'll be doing uh, some drone work, getting some aerial footage of uh, potential locations around the residential school. We'll be doing some field walks in some areas, just looking at areas in which we believe there may be burials. As I was mentioning, this is a three-step or three-stage investigation. And the first stage is purely research, We're looking at our old archival documentation from, from the different churches that are associated with this resident church that was associated with this residential school to uh, government records. Um, so that would be stage one. Stage two would be, is, uh, we would call it ground truthing. Should the research indicate that there are unmarked burial sites associated with uh, the residential school, um, we will have uh, access to modern technology. Um, as, as you may have uh, heard or read about other residential schools, they all talk about things like ground penetrating radar and, and various other kinds of technologies. We will have access to that full gamut of um, modern technology to try and uh, determine if there are remains in the ground. And, and this equipment is, uh, it takes a professional to operate it, and that's who will be operating it. Some of our partners out there have the skills to do this kind of work. Um, and I guess I should mention that um, in total, 21 different First Nations had children attend this residential school. And that 21 includes Chippewa of the Thames. So we are reaching out to the 20 First Nations in and around southwestern Ontario that had students attend this school. I shouldn't say students, I should say children. Because based on what we have read and, and discovered, it may not have been a school in a traditional sort of setting where you go to learn the skills you need to survive in contemporary or society a hundred years ago. It may have been a school of a different nature. Step three of uh, this investigation. The first step is research. Second step is ground truthing. The third step. This would only occur if we, if remains are discovered. And I want to assure people that um, should that occur, that our health department and social services will have resources and people ready to help. And um, on that note, I think it's premature to talk about burial sites or unmarked burial sites at Chippewa Thames. It may be premature, but it's very, it is prudent to plan for it. My name is Kelly Riley, and I want to thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Bon mapi. Bonjour Anishna everyone. My spirit name is Manitou Benizik, which means Thunderbird Woman, but my Ming English name is Gina Migaki. 
I am honored to be here on this life journey as the Anishinaabe Adzuin Director in supporting and remembering and revitalizing and reclaiming our traditional language and ways for our Dishkan Zibi community. It is at this time my word comes from me, from me to you in helping to remember this important Orange Shirt Day regarding the history of the Mount Elgin Industrial Residential School and Model Farm. It began in the early 19th century. First Nation people was in a place with no land due to the increase of settlers wanting land and their traditional life was changing. In 1844, Reverend Peter Jones had a vision of a manual labor school that would educate First Nation children by providing them the skills to be part of this new and rapidly changing world. So he ventured out to raise funds to build the school in which he was successful in getting funds from Great Britain, the U.S. and the Wesleyan Methodist Society. It was the government that agreed to pay a per student grant for the students as well as the chiefs in the area agreed to pay a quarter of their annual annuities to help run the school. The church then paid for other expenses, but it was recouped by the profits of the farm. The First Nations perspective was, the, was, was to bring the opportunity to bring our people out of poverty and starvation as it became difficult to maintain a traditional way of life of living off the land. School would provide them, the children, with the skills needed to adapt and to make a living in this new Western world. Mount Elgin Residential School was established in 1849 and opened its doors in 1850 with 13 students in its first year. The first principal was Reverend Samuel Jones, who was not sensitive to Native culture and implemented a strict schedule of seven and a half hours of physical labor and five and a half hours of schooling. The curriculum at that time consisted of reading, scripture, geography, arithmetic, and writing. Students only had one hour for play. Many students indicated the usefulness of practical skills, but at the same time, they faced harsh experience of longing for their families, loneliness, hunger, lack of parental nurturing, bullying by older students, and abuse at the hands of the school officials. In order to upkeep the school, children were often put to work on the farm by building the farm infrastructures, keeping up with the fields, caring for the animals, and harvesting the milk, eggs, and, and the garden. Unfortunately, the children never seen the fruits of their labor and was given limited and stale food. Other issues arise due to overcrowding of students, disease outbreaks such as tuberculosis and scarlet fever, the class sizes were large and some students remained at the school past the age of 16 to continue their labor on the farm and in the residence. The school did close in 1946 due to the depreciation of the building, the shortage of teachers, limited farm income and complaints by parents on the children being malnourished and underweight, as well as an increase in students running away. On June 11th, 2008, Prime Minister Harper provided a full apologies on behalf of Canadians for the Indian residential school system. In the apology, it acknowledges the separation of Indigenous children from their families, the removal and isolation of children from the influences of, the, of their homes, traditions, and their culture, and forced them into their policy of assimilation, which was wrong and has caused great harm. Children was inadequately fed, closed and housed, deprived of the care and nurturing of the parents, grandparents and community, language and culture practices were prohibited, prohibited and some children died and others never returned home. The assimilation policy had lasting effects and damages that impacted on the Aboriginal culture, heritage and language and many stories were told by survivors of the tragic accounts of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse 
and neglect and the powerless separation from their families and their communities. This legacy of Indian residential school has now created intergenerational social problems that exist that continue to exist today with profound impacts that continue to haunt the survivors, their families, and the communities, which is resulting in the inability to parent their own children, nurturing, trust, loss of language and culture, self-confidence, and self-worth, all leading up to very other social problems Indigenous people are still suffering today. So as part of the Prime Minister's apology, the government asks Indigenous people for forgiveness for failing them and to move forward to begin the healing and the reconciliation and the resolution by implementing the Indian residential school and day school settlements for the survivors, the families and the community. So I leave you with this story to think about. It's the story about the lily root from the Ojibwe's. One day, Mishoma, Mishoma as we call him grandfather, and his grandson were walking in the bush. They came across a small river with a big pond. Mishoma saw some water lilies in the pond. He asked his grandfather to get him a lily root. Lily roots are really important to Mishomas. When he dries the roots and ground it into a powder, it becomes medicine. Mishomas would use this medicine to keep him healthy. His grandson removed his boots and socks, then rolled up his pant legs. And when he stepped into the pond, he felt the mud oozing between his toes. Mishoma stood on the shore and pointed to the lily plant he wanted. When the boy reached the lily plant, his pants and legs were wet and muddy. The ooey muck from the bottom of the pond was smelly and dirty. He reached into the water and quickly pulled out the root, pulled out the root. <clears throat> Be careful, Mishomas told him. You must not break the root when it's pulled up. The medicine will be spoiled if it is taken from a broken root. When his fingers were around the root, his grandson gave it a hard yank. Nothing happened. He put his other hand around it. Be careful now, instructed Mishomas. When he yanked it the second time, the boy's shirt became wet with muddy water, but the root still did not move. The boy could hear his grandfather on the shore. Reach deeper with both hands, said Mishomas. Very slowly, the boy bent over the beautiful white lily flower. He reached with both hands for a better grip around the root. His shirt sleeves were soaked. He pulled hard. The root refused to budge. Finally, he realized he would have to get all wet with the muddy water. It still smelled. He held his breath quickly. His face went under the water. He bent right over the plant with both hands deep around the stubborn root. He pulled and pulled. When the root came free, he almost fell over in the water. He walked back to the shore to Mishomas. He was wet from head to toe. His skin was itchy. Mud covered his feet, his pants and his shirt. He carried the lily in his muddled hand. At the end of the plant was this beautiful white flower. At the end of the other was the muddy root. As Mishomas cleaned the mud from the lily root, he hummed softly, then he cut off the flower. He looked at his grandson who stood beside him. He was wet and muddy. His clothes smelled like muddy pond. His toes and feet were still slippery with mud. Mishomas laughed at the sight of his grandson. Mishomas held up the lily root very gently. This will make me feel strong and healthy, he said to the boy. Next to Mishomas, the beautiful white flower lay discarded on the ground. The root is more important than the flower, he said. Many people are only interested in the pretty flower, he said. Remember the lily root. 
So I read this story to ask why is this story is so important for this Orange Shirt Day. It is to remember the important connections, connections between our survivors, our ancestors of residential schools and their stories and where we are today as intergenerational survivors. Breaking the root remembers what the children lost when they went to residential school. Why is it important to take the lily plant as a symbol of what we do today is to ensure that we do not break our language and culture ever again. Also, the importance of healing, like cleaning the root and to move forward to be strong and healthy and to live a good life. To remember the root is just as important as the flower, flower is, just like life is remembering our history is just as important today to live a good life. Miigwech. Bonjour, Nancy Delary and Dishnikaz, Dishkan Zibing and Donjaba. Hello, my name is Nancy Delary and I am the culture coordinator for the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. I'm going to relay the story of how the two monuments of the Mount Elgin Indian Industrial School and the Children's Monument came to be. In the year 2011, our Chief and Council had made the plan that they wanted to build a monument to commemorate all of our children who were taken and sent to the residential school that operated on our First Nation for a hundred years. We also wanted to commemorate all the children who were taken and taken to other residential schools. So we struck a committee. We had asked and put a call out to all our members who had attended residential school to come and join us and meet with us for a year to plan how this monument would look and how the gathering would uh, be held to unveil the monument. So in that time, there were a number of dedicated uh, residential school survivors who met every month and who came and we shared uh, stories and we shared ideas and we came up with this plan to build this monument. It was also in those discussions in the uh, working group was that there was a division on where to place this monument. Uh, some residential school survivors felt that this monument needed to be in a place that would be seen by our members and by our community every day so that we would never forget. But the problem with that was that in order for that monument to be placed, it would have to be in our administration complex. But our monument, um, but the Mount Elgin Indian Industrial School uh, was a little bit off the um, main road. And so it was kind of tucked away on the back uh, side by the river. And so they felt that by putting the monument there, it wouldn't be seen and then eventually it would be forgotten. So after many discussions and going over plans, we decided to build two monuments. So in the year 2012, we had built this monument. We had put a call out to all our um, First Nations to submit to us names of their family members or their names uh, so that they could be included and in, in etched on these uh, plaques on this monument. So we know that all the names are not on these monuments because from what we had to work with is names that would come from living memory. We know that we don't have names from children who attended here from the first years of this, uh, when this residential school opened. It was in June 2012 that we unveiled this monument of the Mount Elgin Indian Industrial School. It was a very, very hot day. 
We had a huge tent that our guests sat under. We had speakers who came from other First Nations to come and speak. Yeah, we had many speakers from, uh, from the Assembly of First Nations mm -hmm. and Sean Atlio. And we also had Elijah Harper who came and spoke. Uh, also who spoke was uh, Eva Jewell, my daughter. And she gave a speech from the perspective of a young person. And it is her speech and my speech, which I had given, which was really an introduction on um, the monument and, and how we had worked together with the working committee. So the second monument that we built um, was designed uh, by the residential school survivors to be a bronze sculpture of two children. And uh, we had chose that the children would be wearing the clothes that the children, uh, when they attended residential school, wore uh, every day, which was coveralls and uh, the girls wore a dress with uh, pockets. Um, so I had chosen uh, two students from our uh, Antler River Elementary School to pose for me. And I sculpted them and we had the uh, sculpture uh, made into bronze. And so a year after this monument was unveiled, we unveiled that monument in June of 2013. And so we had an unveiling ceremony and a commemoration for our survivors. The, the, it was, uh, that monument was meant for, to commemorate the children who attended residential schools from Chippewa, Muncie, and Oneida. Years after the operation of Mount Elgin Industrial School, many of the barns and old buildings collapsed through the passage of time or were destroyed by fire all except for one horse barn which still stands on the former grounds of the school today. This barn once housed the thoroughbred horses that students of Mount Elgin were tasked with taking care of. The barn itself contains old etchings and scrawlings made on the wooden beams by the children who spent much of their day working in the fields and in the barns. Some etchings date back as far as 1895. The Save the Barn campaign was created out of the need to restore and establish this barn as a World Heritage Site and a future interpretive center, where tourists can learn about the Mount Elgin Indian Industrial Residential School and its impacts, as well as to provide a place of healing for community members and family members of former residential school survivors. It is our wish to keep the barn as a reminder of our resiliency as First Nations peoples and for the barn to be used as an educational resource a place for those wanting to learn about the history of residential schools and to hear the stories of former survivors. To submit a donation to the Save the Barn campaign, you may contact the Anishinaabe Adzwin Department at 519-264-2500.